This CD contains lessons 9, 10, 11, 12 and 13 for June 2018 from the series End Time Events. Sabbath afternoon, May 26. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we know that the end of time is not too far away, but we know that we can trust in you because we have assurance of salvation through Jesus Christ. And as we open your word today, as we look this week at what your word has to say about deceptions that will come towards the end of time, we pray that our hearts may be open to your Holy Spirit guiding us and that our lives will be such that others will want to know about the Jesus that we love. We pray in his dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Revelation chapter 12 and verse 6. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Let's read that again, Revelation 12, verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Even in heaven, before his expulsion, Satan worked to deceive the angels, as we read in the Great Controversy, page 495. Leaving his place in the immediate presence of God, Lucifer went forth to diffuse the spirit of discontent among the angels. Working with mysterious secrecy, and for a time concealing his real purpose under an appearance of reverence for God, he endeavoured to excite dissatisfaction concerning the laws that governed heavenly beings, intimating that they imposed an unnecessary restraint. End of quote. In Eden, Satan disguised himself as a serpent and used trickery against Eve. As he has done all through history, even up through today, Satan also will use deception at the end of the millennium, as we read in Revelation 20 verse 8, in an attempt to gain his ends. And Revelation 20 verse 8 reads, And will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. Unfortunately, he's much smarter, more powerful and craftier than any of us, which is why we need to cling to Jesus and to his word in order to protect ourselves from his wiles. Deuteronomy 4 verse 4 says, But you who held fast to the Lord, your God, are alive today, every one of you. The principle espoused here, indeed, still holds true today as well. This week, we will look at some of the devil's most effective deceptions and how we can be protected from them. Sunday, May 27, The Grandest Deception The first lesson of this quarter talked about the cosmic controversy, which unfortunately has reached beyond the cosmos to our Earth itself. The problem, though, is that many people, Christians included, don't believe in this great controversy because they don't believe in Satan. For them, Bible texts talking about Satan or the devil are merely the expressions of a pre-scientific culture trying to explain evil and suffering in the world. For way too many people, the idea of a literal supernatural entity who has malevolent designs on humanity is the stuff of science fiction, akin to Darth Vader of Star Wars fame or the like question, read the following text, all from Revelation, what do they teach us about the reality of Satan and particularly about his role in last day events? 
Revelation chapter 2 and verse 13. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and do not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. And Revelation chapter 2 and verse 24. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. And Revelation 12, verses 7 to 9. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth, to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God, that they should feed her there one thousand two hundred and sixty days. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. And Revelation 13, verse 2. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And Revelation 20, verse 2, He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And verse 7, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. And finally, verse 10, The devil, who deceived them, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. Revelation shows us just how much power Satan will have over so many inhabitants of the world in the final days, leading them not only away from salvation, but toward persecuting those who stay faithful to Jesus. Of all Satan's devices that we read about in 2 Corinthians 2.11, a translation of the Greek word for mind, neomata, N-E-O-M-A-T-A, perhaps his greatest deception is his ability to cause people to believe that he does not exist. After all, who's going to seek shelter from an overpowering enemy who you don't believe is real? It's astonishing how many claim to be Christians and yet don't take the idea of a literal devil seriously. They hold such a position, however, only by ignoring or radically reinterpreting the many texts in the Word of God that reveal Satan's workings and ploys in this world, especially as we near the end of time. That so many people would reject the literal existence of Satan, even in the face of such overwhelming biblical evidence, should be a powerful reminder to us of just how crucial it is that we understand what the Bible really teaches. And that text in 2 Corinthians 2.11 read, Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So to finish today, although Revelation talks about the machinations of Satan, particularly in the last days, what great hope can we find from Revelation 12 verse 11? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. What is our great source of power against the devil? Monday, May 28. The Two Great Errors Read the following texts. What do they tell us about Satan's power to deceive? First of all, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 to 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. 
And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. And Second Thessalonians 2, 9 and 10. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And Revelation 12, verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And Revelation 20 and verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night, for ever and ever. As we noted in an earlier lesson, Jesus had warned his followers about end-time deceptions. Among those he specifically warned about were the rise of false Christs and false prophets who would deceive many, as it said in Matthew 24, verse 5. False Christs and false prophets, however, are not the only end-time deception of which we have to be aware. Our enemy in the great controversy has many ploys designed to deceive all whom he can. As Christians, we need to be aware of those ploys, and we can do that only through knowing the Bible and obeying what it teaches. Ellen G. White explains what two of these grand deceptions are in The Great Controversy, page 588. Through the true great errors, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power, and, under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. End of quote. How incredible for us, even many years after Ellen White wrote those words, to see just how prevalent the two great errors continue to be in the Christian world. So, to finish today, why are knowledge of Bible truths and a willingness to obey those truths the most powerful weapons we have against the deceptions of the devil, especially in the last days? Tuesday, May 29, The Immortality of the Soul Question. What do the following texts teach us about the state of the dead? What great protection can these texts give us against one of the two great errors? First of all, Ecclesiastes 9, verses 5 and 6. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Never more will they have a share in anything done under the sun. And verse 10, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. And Psalm 115 verse 17, The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. And Psalm 146 verse 4, His spirit departs, he returns to his earth, in that very day his plans perish. And First Corinthians 15 verses 16 to 18, for if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And Daniel chapter 12 and verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. 
In recent decades, much attention has been given to stories about people who have died in that their hearts have stopped beating and they have stopped breathing, only to be revived and brought back to consciousness. In numerous cases, many of these people have told of incredible experiences of a conscious existence after they had supposedly died. Some talked about how they floated in the air and saw from above, their own bodies below. Others reported floating out of their bodies and meeting a wonderful being filled with light and warmth and who espoused truths about kindness and love. Others recounted meeting and talking to dead relatives. This phenomenon has become so common that it even has a scientific name, a near-death experience, that's NDE. Although NDEs remain controversial, many Christians have used them as evidence for the immortality of the soul and the idea that at death the soul goes off to another realm of conscious existence. But NDEs are, of course, another manifestation of one of the two great errors. As long as anyone believes that at death the soul goes on living in one form or another, that person is wide open to most occult or spiritualistic deceptions, deceptions that can easily promote the idea, either openly or by implication, that you don't need Jesus. In fact, most of the people who have had near-death experiences have said the spiritual beings whom they met, or even their dead relatives, gave them comforting words about love, peace and goodness. But nothing about salvation in Christ, nothing about sin, and nothing about judgment to come, the most basic biblical views. One would think that while supposedly getting a taste of the Christian afterlife, they should have gotten the taste of the most basic Christian teachings as well. Yet, often, what they're told sounds much like New Age dogma, which could explain why many of these people come away less inclined toward Christianity than they were before having died. And so to finish today, as Christians, why must we stick to the Word of God even when our senses tell us something different? Wednesday, May 30, Sabbath and the Theory of Evolution As much success as Satan has had deceiving the world in regard to the immortality of the soul, he's been just as successful, if not more so, in usurping the biblical Sabbath for Sunday, as we've looked at in weeks 6 and 8, and has done so for most of Christian history. In recent years, the devil has come up with another deception that lessens the hold of the Seventh-day Sabbath in the minds of people, the theory of evolution. Question. Read Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, through to chapter 2, verse 3. What does this passage teach us about how the Lord created our world and how long it took to do so? Genesis 1, beginning at verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. 
Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning with a fourth day. Then God said, Let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, with which the waters abounded, according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. Even the broadest readings of these verses reveals two points about the biblical account of creation. First, everything was planned and calculated. Nothing was random, arbitrary or by chance. Scripture leaves no room whatsoever for chance in the process of creation. Second, the texts reveal unambiguously that each creature was made after its own kind, that is, each one was made separately and distinctly from the others. The Bible teaches nothing about a common natural ancestry, such as from a primeval simple cell, for all life on earth. Even from a non-literalist interpretation of Genesis, these two points are obvious. Nothing was random in the act of creation, and there was no common natural ancestry for all species. Then, Along comes Darwinian evolution, which in its various forms teaches two things, randomness and a common natural ancestry for all species. 
Why, then, do so many people interpret Genesis through the lens of a theory that, at its most basic level, contradicts Genesis at its most basic level? Indeed, not only has the era of evolution swept up millions of secular people, but many professed Christians believe that they can harmonise it with their Christian faith, despite the blatant contradictions just mentioned. However, the implications of evolution in the context of final events make the danger of the deception even more apparent. Why take seriously a day, the seventh-day Sabbath, as a memorial, not for a six-day creation, but for a creation that took over three billion years? That's the latest date that life supposedly first started on Earth. Evolution denudes the seventh day of any real importance because it turns the six days of creation into nothing but a myth, similar to the one that says Romulus and Remus were nursed by wolves. Also, who, believing that creation required billions of years instead of six days, would actually risk persecution or death by standing for the Sabbath as opposed to for Sunday? Thursday, May 31, The Counterfeit Trinity The concept of the triune nature of God is found all through the Bible. However, in the context of end-time deceptions and persecution, the book of Revelation reveals a counterfeit trinity composed of the dragon, the sea beast, and the land beast of Revelation chapter 13. Question. Read Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, and chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. What is described here? Revelation twelve seventeen. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And Revelation 13, verses 1 and 2. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his authority." The dragon here has been seen as the counterfeit of the father, in that he is the one clearly in control. He also gives power and authority and a throne to the sea beast, the one counterfeiting Christ. Why is this second power seen as a counterfeit Christ? Question. Read Revelation chapter 13, verses 2 through to 5. What are the characteristics of this sea beast? Revelation 13, beginning again at verse 2. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marvelled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying... Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for forty-two months. Besides receiving its authority from the dragon, reminiscent of what Jesus said about receiving his authority from the Father in Matthew 28:18, and Jesus came and spoke to him, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, this sea beast also faced, like Jesus, a death and then a resurrection, as we saw in verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marvelled and followed the beast. Also, this beast is described as exerting his authority for 42 months, or three and a half years, a prophetic counterfeit of Christ's literal three-and-a-half-year ministry, based on the day-for-year principle. Question. Read Revelation 13, verses 11 through to 17. 
How is the land beast described here? Revelation 13, beginning at verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name." This land beast promotes the interest of the sea beast, just as the Holy Spirit glorified not himself, but Jesus, as we read in John 16, verses 13 to 14. However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Also, just as the Holy Spirit performed a powerful act in bringing fire from heaven that we read about in Acts chapter 2 verse 3, the land beast performs something similar in Revelation 13 and verse 13, which reads, He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. John Pauline, writing in What the Bible Says About the End Time, published in 1998, page 111, at the end, the land beast performs a counterfeit of Pentecost. For what purpose? To prove to the world that the counterfeit trinity is the true God. End of quote. So to finish today, what are other end time deceptions of which we need to be aware and... How can we help others recognize them as deceptions as well? Friday, June 1. Let's dwell more on the implications of the theory of evolution in the context of last-day events, especially in regard to the role of the Sabbath. One reason that Charles Darwin, the originator of the theory, promoted evolution was that, not understanding the great controversy, he had a difficult time reconciling evil and suffering with the idea of a benevolent and loving creator. Because of this error, he looked in another direction for answers. It wasn't a coincidence either that during the mid to late 1800s, as Darwin was revising and reworking his theory of evolution, God raised up a movement, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which counted everything for which Darwin's theory stood. How interesting that the Seventh-day Adventist Church, whose creationist underpinnings are revealed in its very name, started growing and expanding in about the same time that Darwin's theory did. Perhaps if Darwin had read and believed these few short lines from Ellen White, the world might have been spared one of the grandest blunders of human thought since geocentricism and spontaneous generation. From Education, page 26, we read, Although the earth was blighted with the curse, nature was still to be man's lesson book. It could not now represent goodness only. For evil was everywhere present, marring earth and sea and air with its defiling touch. Where once was written only the character of God, the knowledge of good, was now written in also the character of Satan, the knowledge of evil. From nature, which now revealed the knowledge of good and evil, man was continually to receive warning as to the results of sin. End of quote. 
Yet Darwin did devise his evolutionary speculations, which are all based on a false understanding of the nature and character of God and the fallen world in which we live. Unfortunately, the implications of his theory will make people prey to Satan's deceptions, especially in the final crisis. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. Why do so many Christians reject the idea of a literal Satan? What does this view teach us about how dangerous it is to reject the clear teaching of the Bible? 2. What can you say to a person who claims that his or her near-death experience shows that we go on living after death? And 3. What other reason could there be for why those who believe in evolution would be so much more susceptible to deceptions in the last days? Inside Story Our mission story this week is by Andrew McChesney from Adventist Mission. It's titled Jailed for Manslaughter. A 2am bar brawl in the US state of Alaska turned violent when 28-year-old Tony Puisi struck a man with a single punch. The man fell and hit his head on the ground. He died the next day. Tony was charged with felony manslaughter, which carries a maximum prison sentence of 20 years. I was devastated, Tony said. I was scared. My whole life flashed before my eyes. From his jail cell, Tony remembered his upbringing in faraway Shelton, a small town in Washington state. His family never had read the Bible or attended church. He had used alcohol and illegal drugs as a teen and quit high school before completing 11th grade. As an adult, he had moved to Alaska to work as a commercial fisherman. In jail, Tony began to pray desperately. I said, if there is a God, I want to know that he is real. Tony, now 30, said in an interview, I was crying on my knees for hours a day for help. Tony borrowed a Bible from the jail library and, to his astonishment, felt an overwhelming sense of peace and joy as he read it. He found special hope in Deuteronomy 31 verse 6, one of the first Bible verses that he memorized. It reads, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you, nor forsake you. As I prayed and read the Bible, God did miracles in my life, Tony said. After some time, Tony's publicly appointed lawyer announced that she had good news. The potential prison sentence had been reduced to two to four years. Then the sentence was cut to one to three years on reduced charge of negligent homicide. One day, Tony found a small card on a bookshelf in the jail library, an invitation for Discover Bible Lessons from the Voice of Prophecy, a Seventh-day Adventist ministry. He sent away for the lessons and eagerly studied them. What's amazing is that I drank, I did drugs, and I didn't graduate from high school, but I understood the Bible, he said. That's amazing, right? You don't have to be a scholar to understand the Bible. Shortly after completing the Bible studies, Tony's case came up in court. There, Tony said, God worked a miracle. The judge handed down a three-year suspended sentence. Tony was free. God delivered me from jail, Tony said. The whole time I was in there was nine months. And we'll read more about Tony Poesi next week. Your reader for this week's Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide has been Dr. Percy Harold. It has been produced in the studios of Christian Services for the Blind, distributed under the auspices of the Sabbath School Department by HopeChannel.com.